Good morning. We are going to be in the book of Deuteronomy today. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. We're going to be starting in verse 1 and go through verse 14, 15, right around there today. Can you believe it's already the end of 2015? Todd and I were joking at staff meeting last January that before you know it, it's going to be Christmas. And then we looked up at staff meeting two weeks ago and we said, you know what, it's Christmas. You know, my parents always said that time goes more quickly when you, when you age. And I thought, oh yeah, right. But it does, doesn't it? I mean, this, is, this year has just flown by. Some of us have had great years and wonderful years and great things happening in our lives, and some of us have had awful things and tough and difficult things happen in our lives. I think most of our years have probably been mixed up in that manner. We have some great times and we have some difficult times. We have all of these happening within us, and and we get to the end of the year, and we get ready and prepare for 2016. Now, I've had people tell me that, you know, it's just another day. You know, 2016, January 1st and all that stuff, I mean, it's really just another day. The sun still comes up, the sun goes down and, and all of this. But I, I think we miss the point many ways because God is the one that orchestrated everything. He gave us the calendar. And he did so by the movement of the world. You see, the day happens because the earth turns. And the year happens because the earth goes around the sun. And through his creation, he gave us measurements of time. You see all through scripture how he uses time and time and gives us years and months and days and weeks and and all of these measures of time. So I think as people, we need to not think that, you know, 2016 is just another year. It's another year God has given us. And how we deal with 2016 is going to be based upon how we have dealt with 2015. The title of the message today is, Don't Waste the Past. Don't waste the past. Too many of us want to just forget things that have happened to us. We just want to, man, just erase those memories, get over with, and and move forward. But God has a different opinion of things. Today, as we look at this passage today, He's going to command us to remember the past. He's going to tell us why to do that, and He's going to remind us to don't forget where we've been. You see, God has a plan for us, and and he gives it to us in his word. And we need to pay attention. Let's go to the word. We're going to begin chapter 8, Deuteronomy, beginning in verse 1. You must be careful. You must carefully follow every command I am giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and take possession of the land the Lord swore to your fathers. Remember that the Lord your God led you on the entire journey these 40 years in the wilderness so that he might humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you by letting you go hungry. Then he gave you manna to eat, which you and your fathers had not known, so that you might learn that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out. Your feet did not swell in those 40 years. Keep in mind that the Lord your God has been disciplining you as a man disciplines his son. So keep the commands of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with streams of water, springs and deep water sources, flowing in both valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and figs and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land where you will eat food without shortage where you will lack nothing, a land whose rocks are iron and from whose hills you will mine copper. When you eat and are full, you will praise the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. Be careful that you don't forget the Lord your God by failing to keep his command, the ordinances and the statutes that I am giving you today. When you eat and are full and build beautiful houses to live in and your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold multiply and everything else you have increases, be careful that your heart doesn't become proud and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. He led you through the great and terrible wilderness with its poisonous snakes and scorpions, a land 
Thirsty where there was no water, he brought water out of the flint-like rock for you. He fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers had not known, in order to humble and to test you so that in the end he might cause you to prosper. You might say to yourself, my power and my own ability have gained this wealth for me. But remember that the Lord, your God, gives you the power to gain wealth in order to confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is today. We read this passage, Moses is writing by the power of the Holy Spirit in him. He is preparing. They have come to the edge of the promised land. The Israelites have wandered through the wilderness for 40 years because of their disobedience and lack of faith. Now they come right to the edge here, right to the Jordan where God has said, that will be your inheritance. He is preparing them. Moses knows at this point that he is not going into the promised land. He knows that he had sinned when the father had told him to speak to the rock to give water. Moses was so frustrated that he hit the rock with his staff and did it his own way. God said, by the way, you're not going into the promised land. But now Moses is writing Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy is to remind the Israelites what they've been through what God has done, and then to give them instructions on how to live once they get to the promised land. You see, they needed to, to know, because how many of us forget things very easily, what, the God, what God has done for us? Moses is reminding them what to do. The first thing that he shares with them, verse 2, is to remember. Remember. You look at verse 1, and he says, You must carefully follow every command I am giving you today. And the first command that he gives is in verse 2, and he said, Remember, remember that the Lord your God led you on the entire journey these 40 years in the wilderness. Remember. It's amazing what the Lord does in our lives, isn't it? I mean, if we just sat here for a moment and took a catalog of of what has happened in 2015 in our lives, okay, the good, the bad, the indifferent, if we took a catalog and just went back and, and reviewed our life this year, we can understand one very important thing, that God was with us every moment of every day. The good times, the bad times, the in-between times, the times we were bored, the times we were excited, the frustration, the crying, the laughter, the happiness, the joy, the angst, all of those things, God was with us in the midst of all of that. You see, the 40 years that the Israelites wondered, not all of it was beautiful. Not all of it was great. As a matter of fact, most of it was very difficult. They were having to pay because of the sins that they had committed against the Lord. You see, in the midst of it, he goes on to say, verse 3, He humbled you by letting you go hungry. Then he gave you manna to eat, which you and your fathers had not known, so that you might learn that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. You see, they got out there. They had seen the Lord do these incredible plagues in Israel, I mean, in Egypt, that we see the the, all of the things that happened, the Nile turns to blood, and all of these amazing things happen. And then finally, they, they get rescued. The Exodus, they come out of Egypt, and they, they get to the Red Sea, and they wait there, and they say, Moses, why did you bring us here? Was there not enough graves in Egypt? We're going to get killed by the army. And God parted the Red Sea so that the Israelites could go through on dry land, and they've seen all of these miraculous things. But yet, as we read the story in Exodus, we know that they complained. And they complained, oh Lord, that was great, I'm glad you parted the waters, but I'm hungry. God, don't you realize you parted the waters, but I have nothing to drink. I mean, God, do you really care about me? I mean, I want something cold. I want it, I want it just the way I like it. I want this and this and this. And yet, in the midst of all of that, the Lord put up with them. He let them go hungry so that they could understand what it means for God to provide. You see, I doubt any of us today have ever really gone hungry. We have in our country the blessing of of everything we need. We may have missed a meal or two, 
But none of us understand the hunger that they went through. It says that God did this to humble them so that they would understand that they need him. He let them go hungry, and then he provided manna. And the beauty thing of manna, the, the Hebrew word manna means, what is it? That's what manna means. When you read it in the Old Testament, manna means, what is it? Because they didn't know what it was either. God tells them to eat it. They can make bread from it. They can do all these great things with it. But he said here, he reminded them that they might learn that man doesn't live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. You see, whatever you've been through this year, it is the act of a sovereign, loving Father bringing us to Him. And we neglect the Word of God so often. You see, Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit out into the wilderness to be tempted and tested by the devil. The devil comes full guns ablazing, And he tempts him. But every response that Jesus gave was only Scripture. He was quoting Scripture alone, which is his own word, by the way. Jesus in Matthew 4 refers to this very passage. Man doesn't live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. You see, too many times we as the people of God forget how important the Word of God is. These things that the Lord did with them these 40 years pointed out their shallow faith and their lack of confidence in God. You realize the things that you've gone through that were difficult this year, God was using those things to draw you to Him. Not just because He's a mean God, He likes to, he likes to create drama in your life. No, He does these things to point out weaknesses in us. You see, the wilderness can make or break a person. The hard times in your life can make you or break you. It can point out your weaknesses. It can give you strength. Or it can draw you away from Him to walk away from Him. He gives us the motive in, chapter, in verse 5. He says, Keep in mind that the Lord your God has been disciplining you as a man disciplines his son. The Lord is doing this out of His great love. Maybe there's a point this last year where you complain that God didn't love you anymore. Or you question God's love for you. you. You said, God, if you loved me, you wouldn't let me go through this. Lord, if you, if you really loved me, you would get me out of this. And as a loving father, he says, you know, I'm going to keep you right in the midst of it so that you'll learn. So that you'll learn what you need to learn. Because we're just kids anyway, right? Right? How we deal with our kids and grandkids, etc., is how the Lord deals with us. They think they, can, they think they know everything. And as adults, we realize that we were the same way. And we deal with our kids and our grandkids, and, and we look at them, and, and they know every answer to every question. If not, they'll make it up and be extremely confident that they know what's going on. Can I get an amen? amen. But you see, the way we deal with kids is the way God deals with us. God looks at us and we say, God, I've got this. I've got it. I know exactly what to do. I know exactly what's going to happen. Tomorrow's going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this. And he sits back and he says, Oi, these kids of mine, they think they know everything. You see, but God wants to orchestrate these things so that we can remember what God has done for us. And that he is with us every moment. Look at verse 6. He said, so, so keep the commands of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and fearing him. He says, I want you to remember what the Lord has done for us so that you will walk in his ways and fear him. You see, most of the time in the midst of our disobedience is because we've forgotten what God has done for us. We walk away from the Lord not because we hate him or we don't like him or whatever. We've just forgotten how awesome he is. What He's done for us. We forget how great and awesome our God is and that he's, he's died for us, that all of the things that we have is because of Him and because everything that we have and is blessed with, family, friends, houses, clothes, love, health, peace, all of that is because God's goodness. And we forget that. 
And when we start to forget what God has done in our lives, we wander away like a child chasing after another toy. You see, Moses is reminding the Israelites that they need God. Remember what God has done. Now let me ask you, did did everything this year go as you planned it? We, we write out what we're going to do this year. You know, we think of these things and we plan out our year. And some people do that. I don't do that. I plan out my day. Uh, but we get to the end of and, and we think, what in the world's happened here? I mean, nothing went in 2015 like, I was, like it was supposed to happen. Has that happened to anybody here besides me? But you see, God's in the midst of that too. How many of us have had great victories and seen God answer prayers left and right this year? How many of us have have seen God um, show us through the rough patches? How many of us have seen God do things that we can't explain? You see, too many people want to forget. Want to forget what's happening. See, that's why drugs are so important, because drugs want to make you forget until you can remember again. That's why alcohol is so important to many people because they want to drink away their sorrows. That's why people run to, to, to half gallons of bluebell ice cream to try to remember, not remember, try to go past all the things that you wanted to forget. It's why we spend time in the, the buffet, right? Because we get that good feeling after we're stuffed and for that moment we forget about all the things that have happened to us. But you see, God said that's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to remember those things. You're supposed to remember. You're supposed to remember how God is good in every part of it. You see, we forget that. God is reminding us through Moses today, remember 2015. The goods, the bads, the ups, the downs, the sideways. And remember that God has his hand in all of it. In all of it. We look all this, and we often ask the question, why? And that's the second point in the message today is why. Why does all of this happen? That's probably the most common question that I get as a pastor. Why does God let this happen to me? Well, why did I get this diagnosis? Or why does that happen? Why do these people run away from me? What is, why, why, why? And there's really no cut and dried answer that's easy to every one of them. But he gives us a bit of an answer here in, cha- in verse 2. He says, remember, okay, that the Lord your God led you on the entire journey these 40 years in the wilderness. And here's the why. So that he might humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. You see, the Lord lets all these things happen to us to humble us. One of the greatest problems that we have as humans and Christians alike is that we become too self-sufficient. Right? We, we can do it ourselves, God. Right? I, I mean, I can do this on my own. I, I don't need to pray to you, God, because I've been down this road before, and I can walk this path myself, and God, I'll call you when I need you. Right? And then we go along, and God's just waiting they're waiting for us to talk to him and pray and so that he can explain to us what's going on and he can lead us through these things. But oftentimes we don't do that, do we? We rely on ourselves more than we do on God. A lot of the stupid things that we've gone through in 2015 is because we're stupid people. We have far more confidence in ourselves than we do in God. Our life breaks down, things go sideways, and we wonder why, and God reminds us, he says, because you're trying to do it in your own strength. You wonder why your health has gotten bad. Well, it's because we don't take care of ourselves. That's our own choice. You wonder why relationships are are, are going crazy. Well, it's because you're too selfish. You're not looking to love others more than you're being. All of these things happen in our lives, and God says that they're allowed so that they would humble us. You see, we don't actually 
forget God, but we lose the reality of the awareness of our dependence on God. Right? We get up in the morning, we brush our own teeth, we pay our own bills, we drive our own car, we work at our jobs, we live our lives, and in the midst of all of that, God is wanting to do great things in us, but yet we slowly walk away. None of us got up this morning and said, you know, today I'm walking away from the Lord. I've never known a Christian believer that has gotten away from the Lord that said that that's what their plan was. Right? None of them say, hey, you know, God, this gosh, God thing isn't working real well. I'm just going to start walking away from the Lord slowly but surely. It doesn't happen like that. It happens slowly and incrementally. I heard a great story. There's a pastor that had gone to see one of the church members that had been away from the church for quite a while. It was a cold night. There was a great fire burning in the fireplace, and the man invited the preacher in, and they sat in front of the fireplace, and they're talking. And the pastor's like, you know, I... Now, where you been? What's been going on? He says, oh, well, you know, I've been busy, uh, been doing all these things, and I just haven't really had time to be at church, and I've got all these. And as he's putting this list of excuses out there for the pastor, the pastor is sitting by the fire, and he takes one of the pokers, and he takes one of the red-hot coals, and he moves it from the fire, and he moves it out on the hearth. They begin and continue to talk, and after a few moments, they both looked down and that red hot coal that had been hot in the midst of the fire when it was pulled out was gray and cold. The pastor looked down at the coal and looked at the man. The man looked at him, he says, not he said, I get it, Pastor. I get it. You see, one of the things that the devil has tried to do to each one of us is to try to keep us away from the fellowship of the people of God. He tries to keep us out of Sunday schools, small group Bible study. He tries to keep us away from any kind of activities. He, he keeps us away from all of that because he knows that the people of God flourish when they're together as the people of God. But you see, he allows all this stuff to happen to us to draw us back. You see, we see it all the time. I've been there. You've been there. We've got people that are in the midst of it in our church right now. They are self-sufficient. They have walked away. They haven't been in church for a while. And things are going to go crazy in 2016, and we will see them back. What do we do? Do we shame them when they come back? Oh, you should have been in church. No, we love them because we've all been there. But the, the hope is that our memories... We'll remember that time, and we won't walk away from the Lord slowly but surely again. You see, God wants us together, together, working together as the body. That is where the church is His design. You cannot function as a living, breathing, walking, spirit-filled Christian by yourself. You cannot. It is not God's design. We are here together to be God's people brought together by His love with the common spirit in each of us. You see, God wants us to understand that it is to humble us, to bring us back to Him. Then He says here that humble us and to test you to know what was in your heart. He not only wants to humble us, but He wants to test us. Now understand how we read this. We read this oftentimes, the first time you read that, that verse there, you think, oh, well, he's going to test us so that he can find out what's in our heart. That's not the way we should read that verse. God knows everything. He already knows our heart. And so what he's saying here is that he is testing us so that we will know our own heart. You see, many of us have blind spots. Not just in your car that you can't see when you're driving. But we all have blind spots in our life that we can't see. I mean, we give ourselves too much credit. We think we're far better people than we really are. We think we love the Lord far more than we really do love the Lord. Right? We think we do all these good things and all this because God, and really, in fact, it's not. It's because of us. You see, God allows this to happen to humble us and to test us to show us what is in our hearts. You never know what you're capable of until you get to the point of you have nowhere else to turn. 
and you've got to react in the midst of something, and you will see what comes out of your heart. Perfect example, middle of the night, walking through the house, barefooted, you step on a Lego. What comes out of your mouth at that point is illustrative of what your heart is saying. Stubbing your toe as you're going to the restroom in the middle of the night in the dark. What you say and what you think at that moment is very illustrative of your heart. You see, we give ourselves far too much credit. And the thing is, is we don't learn from those things. How many people here have ever done something and you've been through it and it seems like you have? It happens every year. The same kind of thing hits you every year. Something goes wrong in your life and it's like you're living it over and over again. Well, it's because you didn't learn from it the first time. I get the question a lot about finances. You see, a lot of people have financial problems all the time. And they think things should change, but they don't change anything. Well, God's trying to teach you something in the midst. If your finances stunk in 2015, it's not because you didn't have enough money. It's because you didn't have enough God. Now, I'm not preaching health, wealth, prosperity here, but we understand when we honor the Lord, He takes care of us. When we honor the Lord with our finances, He provides we are honoring him and saying, God, this is yours. This is not mine. You do with it what you want. And we see God bless us and bless us and bless us and bless us. If you've got a recurring health problem, that's something that is not correctable by surgery, whatever it may be, why do we just continue to let ourselves be sickly and unhealthy? And we rely on medication after medication after medication and we don't get ourselves back in shape and we don't eat right and we continue living the way that we're living. You see, that's insanity. We ask God to heal our bodies, but yet we still go to the buffet and eat with both hands. You see, there's a why that God wants us to understand. We have to be humble before Him. And then he tests us to show us what is inside of us. He does this so that we can remember. That we won't continue to make the same mistakes over and over and over again. You look at the Israelites, they made the same mistakes over and over and over again. It was because they refused to learn the lesson that God was trying to get them to learn. You see, he gives us the why. But then he reminds us in verse 11. Be careful that you don't forget. The third thing on your listening outline is don't forget. Now this is a different word than the word remember in verse 2. This word is a word that's, it is a emphatic that says, don't forget, dummy. That's the Hebrew translation, really. But look what he says, don't forget. Don't forget the Lord by failing to keep his command, the ordinances and the statues that I am giving you today. He says, when, you're eating, when you eat and are full and build beautiful houses to live in and your herds and your flocks grow large and, and your silver and your gold multiply and everything else you have increases, be careful that your heart doesn't become proud. And you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. You see, that's what happened to Israel over and over again. They ran into trouble. And they, they come to this beautiful lake, but the lake is bad water. So they cry out to God. God says, Moses, throw that log into the water and it will make the water sweet. So he did. So they get around and there's a bunch of snakes, poisonous vipers that are biting the people and they're dying. And they say, God, save us, save us, God. And so he says, take a snake and put it up on a stick and hold it up where everybody can see it. When everybody sees it, they'll be saved from the snake. 
God, we don't have anything to eat. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll give you some manna. God, we don't have anything to drink. Well, I'll give you water from a rock. You see, in our lives, we go through these moments of humbling. We go through these moments of testing. And then when we get through that and we're in the easy part, right? When we get into that part to where we do, our flocks have multiplied, our, our house is great, we've got things going, and all these good things are happening. He says, don't forget that it was God who did that, not you. Look at verse 17. You may say to yourself, my power and my own ability have gained this wealth for me. But remember that the Lord, your God, gives you the power to gain wealth. In order to confirm his covenant, he swore to your fathers as it is today. You see, there we go back to that self-sufficiency. We start in the midst of the easiness and the time that God has worked and gotten us out of the pit, and we are now walking through the midst of the beautiful garden of our life, and we forget that it was God that got us out of the pit and set our feet upon dry land and walked us through the beauty of what He has given us. You see, that's what happens too. People will run to the church when things are in trouble, but then things get good again, we don't see people again. How many of us have done that? You see, but God says, don't forget that it is God that did that. He gave us the ability to do whatever he's called us to do. If you're a great carpenter or an engineer or whatever it may be that God has called you to be, he's given you that ability. Just pause for a moment. You see, that heartbeat that you just had was given to you by God. He can stop it just like that, believe me. That breath you just took, it was because God's grace that you were able to breathe in with these things called lungs uh, that have made all of this air something that we can run our bodies on. God designed us that way. He provided everything for us. We should never forget that God is the one that provides everything we need. It's not by our brilliance. It's not by some kind of luck. It's not by our hard work many times. Hard work is, necess is a necessity as we work with God. But understand, we are where we are because God has made it that way. Don't forget God in the midst of the prosperity. Don't forget God when things get better. You see, one of the greatest indicators of a person's character is not so much how they react in the hard times, but how they react in prosperity. You see, we forget that. It is, if we are prosperous, we often walk away from the Lord. But sadly, it often takes tragedy. It often takes difficulty to shake us and wake us up. Help us to remember that we've forgotten God yet again. Oh... We've all sat down there at some point in our Christian life, haven't we? And we said, you know, I used to read the Bible every day. You know, I used to have a good prayer life. You know, I used to just go to church all the time and really enjoy being with the people and going to Bible study and doing this. You know, I used to serve the Lord. You see, God wants us not to have that word used to. He wants us to be a word that is today, a word that means I will, I will, I do, I am following the Lord. You see, as we look at our year, this 2015, look back at some things in your life. Did your finances stink? Have they been stinking for a long time? It's because God's trying to teach you a lesson as a believer in Christ that he's your provider not your bank or your job? Has there been relationships in your life that have gone south, that have changed, that have gone and gotten worse? God's trying to teach you that relationships matter and they're important in this life. He wants to change you. How about our health? Have we gotten some things in our lives, some, some wake-up calls from the doctor? Well, it's because we're not treating the temple of God right. 
present company included. What else is it? Your faith, has your faith not grown in a while? Are you you still drinking the milk of the Word of God when He says we're supposed to progress to the stake? Have you grown in your relationship with Christ in 2015? You see, those are questions we have to ask because God wants us to come closer to Him. We forget that the purpose of our life here on this earth is to love God and then love everybody else. We switch that. I'll love everybody else and then I'll love God. No, he says, I'm first. And when we love God first, everything will work out. It doesn't make life easy, but you'll have peace in the midst of the storm. He will take care of you when you get that diagnosis. He will love on you when you feel unlovable. He will strengthen you when you're weak. He will lead you to the promised land when you're... You don't even know where you're at. You see, as believers in Christ, God will help you when you call on Him, but you've got to be humbled, and He has to show you what's in your heart to turn us back to Him. You see, God wants to unravel all the things in our life that are tangled in a mess. I read just a couple of weeks ago, there was a a store in England Tesco, a British supermarket company, they decided that they were going to hire a person 36 hours a week. You could take in your gnarled up strands of Christmas lights, give it to this guy at this little booth. You could pay him per strand to unravel your strands of Christmas lights. He would test all of the lights and make sure they were all functioning. He would take care of all of that, but it was a A nice price, if you will. It was about 10 pounds per strand, which is a little over, I think, 13 or $14 per strand. The thing that they advertised was that this position will offer you the chance to show how every little thing helps by running the unique in-store service with a friendly, flexible approach and making a genuine difference in the little things that matter most to our customers this Christmas. It says that the ideal candidate would be passionate about Christmas and be very helpful. You see, all of us have these tangled messes of lights in our lives that have gotten tangled from 2015, haven't they? There's a tangled strand of life somewhere in our 2015 that God wants to sit back and He wants to un- Ravel that strand. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's your children. And he wants to sit there and he wants to unravel your gnarled, coiled up, twisted strand of lights that you can't fix. You've tried to fix that. You've tried to unravel that strand, but you can't. You, you can't seem to find that one bulb that, that's broken. But God is saying, give me 2015. Give me all of that. Don't forget it. Remember what you've been through and why I'm doing this. But you see, He can unravel that. Fix all of the light bulbs and make you a brilliant light for Him in 2016. You see, God wants to do this in your life. He wants to change you. As Christians, we we must be always changing. Because we're supposed to look more and more and more like Jesus. Today, if you're not a believer in Christ, if you don't know Christ, what I have just preached to you is going to be foreign. It's going to be a different language. Because apart from Christ, apart from the knowledge of Christ, all of our life are the twisted strands of lights. You see, the Bible tells us very clearly that we are sinners, we are apart from God, that there is a great gulf that is between us and God because of our sin. We can't get to God without the Son, Jesus Christ Himself. 
If we are apart from God and we can't cross that, then if we live this entire life apart from God, never reaching out to God for salvation and knowing and loving Him, then we will be responsible for accounting for our sins all the rest of eternity. The Bible tells us very clearly that place is hell. We pay for the sins that we have committed. Apart from Christ, we have to pay the price ourselves. But the reason that Christ came, born of a virgin, never sinned, took our beating and went to the cross, his blood was shed for our sin, that on the cross the Father laid every sin of man, woman, child, everything, past, present, future, forever. Every sin was laid upon Christ. And he paid the price through his death for our sins. Jesus just tells us, call out to me. Turn, repent from what what you're doing. Put your faith in me. I am the Son of God is what Jesus tells us. Put our faith in Him and He will unravel the strands of our mixed up life. He will repair all the bulbs and He will make us shine brightly for Him. Today, if you don't know Christ, I invite you to come in this invitation to know Him, to put your faith in Him, to know that God has got a plan for your life. And it's not that mixed up, mixed up drama that you've been a part of for so long. God's got peace and love and happiness and joy to put in your heart that you can't find apart from Him. And as believers in Christ, I ask you, during this invitation, you review your life this year. You look at it honestly. (laughs) We love to lie to ourselves, don't we? I think we lie to ourselves more than anybody else. That's a good year. Not bad. And we just gloss over all the things. Today, during the invitation, I want us as believers in Christ to remember. To realize why we've gone through what we've gone through this year. And then don't forget that God's got a plan for us. That He is for us and not against us as believers. He wants the best for us. He wants us to prosper for His glory. But sometimes we're our own worst enemy. So today as we open up this invitation, I just invite you, where you are as believers in Christ, to review this year. During this invitation, if you don't know Christ, I invite you to come. We will lead you to Him. We can't put our faith on your behalf. It is our own faith that we bring to Christ. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to open the invitation. He calls us to action, not to think about lunch. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this word. We thank you for your word today, Lord, the conviction of it, Lord, for me and for us. And Lord, I ask you that as believers right now, you point out to us the things, Lord, this year that we need to change, that we need to learn from, Lord God, so that we don't continue to repeat our past. Lord, I pray for us as believers that you give us humble hearts and teachable spirits right now, that your spirit work on us this very moment, Lord. And that you turn us closer to you. God, I ask for those here that don't know you, Lord, that would spend an eternity apart from you forever. That, Lord, even right now your spirit is drawing them into a relationship with you. And that, Lord, they'll put their faith in you today. Knowing, Lord God, that you are far better than anything this world can offer. There is no riches. There is no anything, Lord God, that can pair to you. Lord, take this time of invitation and move in us. God, we ask you to change us. And I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I invite you right now just to sit there. You can sing if you're led to do so. Our praise team will lead us as we continue to worship. But I really want you to just sit there and to just review shortly in your mind this year the highlights, the lowlights. Recognize where God was in the midst of it. 
and try to learn from it and to walk with him in obedience.